known to you as she is known to us. She is uh, arguably uh, one of the most um, uh, examined and investigated uh, candidates for president we've ever had. Uh, she is in many respects, or she will be as president, Obama 2.0. She has no problem uh, giving us her views on uh, lots of different issues. And you can just go to her website and you'll find them. Uh, which is in so many ways the opposite of what Mr. Trump, as of right now, represents. What I, I'm just going to very briefly sort of set the set the, the tone here, and then uh, I think it would be much more interesting to have a dialogue with you folks. I, I think that would. But let me let me throw out some things. Issues. Two issues I think will are real now for the campaign, and they will move into the presidency uh, after the campaign. First is immigration. The second one is trade. Immigration, obviously, that had the. the Trump has set the table on that one. He's done it at the expense of Mexico. The Mexicans are very used to um, having us beat them with sticks during any one of our elections. But this one has been different. This one has really crossed a line that they have never seen crossed before. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the, um, the speeches of what we call the Three Amigos during the North American Leaders Summit yesterday or the day before. Um, and of course, everyone's asking Peña Nieto, well, what do you think of this Trump fellow? And he, as a good, as a trained professional, said all the right things. And he said, I will be the president of Mexico, irrespective of whether or not Donald Trump becomes the president, et cetera, et cetera. And then he went off on a tangent, and he said two words, Hitler and Mussolini. <laughs> now, in the United States, in a political environment, when you say the words Hitler or Mussolini, he said them both, the conversation is over. There's nothing else to say. And even though he didn't say it with Donald Trump appended to that label, he said it in the same response. Uh, so that's what we've come to, and that's what we've come to with the, with the Mexicans. The Mexicans, irrespective of who becomes president, the damage is done. And I think our president will have to play a little defense uh, on that issue right off the bat. Obviously, it will be much more easy for Hillary Clinton to deal with than, than Trump. Uh, but that, that one's real, and that one will play uh, with a Latino vote. It will play between now and the campaign. That issue will not be off the table in any way. Trade. Yes, Trump is going to rip up all of the uh, all of the um, all the trade agreements, but he, he actually, as a as a juxtaposition to the to the uh, speeches of the three amigos, uh, Trump actually read from a teleprompter, and he said he was going to invoke the uh, exit clause of NAFTA, and he named it, and he said, "This is what I'm going to do when I become president." This is one of those moments where, with, with Trump, it's you, you actually have, you always wonder, well, does he does he believe what he's saying? Should we believe that he will do that? On this one, I believe that he will do that. Um, the trade issue is always complicated in a in a in a U.S. Uh, political environment, certainly an election environment. Um, that has happened to the Dems as well, to the Democrats as well. Um, Bernie Sanders has pushed the issue even further on the Democratic side. I think Hillary, as you all know, used to love the TPP, now doesn't love it so much. I think uh, if she were to become president, she will love it again. Um, but it gives you a sense of how hard this one plays. I think it plays harder than it has in previous elections. Uh, I don't know what happens to the TPP, but it's, it'll be on the table from here to the election. 
If it moves, some people say a 2017 TPP that scaled down, possibly a 2021 TPP, um, should Hillary become president because it's not going to move at all if, if Trump becomes president. Or something happens in the lame duck between now and uh, January after the election. Also possible. Elections themselves. We have 50 different elections in our, in our uh, actually we have 51 because the District of Columbia also votes, but I'm from there and uh, we're always very upset because we are taxed without being represented in Congress, so our vote doesn't really count for it. There are 50 different elections with 50 different rules, and each of those rules is different from the, on the R side as it is on the Dem side. That's how messy it is. But I'll pick out one because I think it's absolutely crucial, Florida. Florida has the Latino vote as a, as a critical element, and the Latino vote in Florida is a very complicated thing, and there are not very many Mexicans, just to make it a little more complicated. There will, are other states in the Southwest where the Latino vote, which is still critical, uh, it looks very different. Uh, so the Latino vote, I think, is absolutely key. I think Florida is absolutely key. Um, Marco Rubio just came back onto the scene. Why? Because um, without Florida, I think the Republicans are sunk. I, I think they go nowhere. Um, and I think everyone needs to, as soon as you, as soon as the two candidates are formally announced, you will see a lot of assets being deployed into Florida on both sides. So the threshold question. To what extent should we be scared of a Trump presidency here in the Americas versus us in the United States? Short, short response, I think we in the United States should be more scared than you in this region. Why? Because roughly along the lines of what Dan just said, I think the policy toward this region will just continue pretty much as it is, irrespective of, of presidencies. Now, you can like that or not, but I think that's pretty much how it's going to go. Um, In the U.S. it's a little bit different. Why? Because if he wins, he will, there's a down-ballot effect. <laughs> Meaning, if someone goes in there and pulls the lever for Donald Trump, they are also likely to pull the lever down the line for Republican candidates. If that should happen, that means they retain the House. Maybe they get the Senate. Dan and I disagree on that. I think they might get the Senate. If, if Trump becomes president, because if Trump becomes president, that means that a wave occurred that, um, uh, that got him there. And of course, he gets a Supreme Court. He gets a Supreme Court right now. There's a vacancy in the Supreme Court. We are deadlocked at 4-4. There's a vacancy, but that's not the only vacancy that's going to happen in this presidency, whichever is next. I count three. That's huge. It's huge on a whole series of issues, including immigration. You guys, I'm sure, know that last week the Supreme Court, the, the deadlocked Supreme Court, uh, uh, told Obama no, he could not uh, do what he wanted to do in terms of discretion with respect to deportations. Uh, gives you a sense of, again, uh, piggybacking on something uh, Dan said, and that is the relative weakness of the presidency in the United States. And we can talk about that further. But, Will our institution save us? We can talk about that. I, in this respect, the fact that the Republican Party is an unmitigated disaster right now might actually help. Because it'll be very, very difficult to get them in lockstep behind Donald Trump. And so even if we have a Republican-controlled Congress, uh, that does not mean that uh, Mr. Trump gets a free ride. So I'll leave it there, and then we can, uh, we, I hope to be able to answer questions. Thank you.